listen for the words of God. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick come down, I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood there, stood before, <laughs> before the law and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself also to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Amen. Today's sermon is entitled, Advent, Jesus is Coming to Town, and will be delivered by Reverend Dr. Chris Dipner. Brothers and sisters, good morning and peace to all of you. Before we reflect together on the meaning of the passage we've read, let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've sent your Son, Jesus, to us to spend time with us, live among us, to help us to know you, to help us to rediscover your plans for us, your salvation that you have in mind for us. We thank you that in this time of Advent, we can especially be reminded of our Lord coming to live among us, to share his life with us. And we pray that this morning, as we reflect together on the meaning of Advent, on what it means that Jesus comes to us, that you will guide our thoughts, open our hearts, that we may receive the message you want to give us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Advent. Uh, this time of year, we often use this word. Advent, actually, the word itself just means a coming. Something or somebody is coming. So, what is coming? Well, of course, Christmas is coming. And even in Taiwan, where so few people are Christians, we are very much, uh, very often reminded of the fact that Christmas is on the way, because whenever we go into a big shopping center, we hear Christmas music. Uh, well, sort of Christmas music, music associated with Christmas, like jingle bells, uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas, uh, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, or Santa Claus is coming to town. So the real meaning of Advent can easily be drowned in all this superficial music and celebration. Because in fact, what is important is not what is coming, but who is coming. And surprise, surprise, it is not Santa who is coming, it's actually Jesus who is coming to town. Advent reminds us that Jesus is coming. He is passing through our town, our city. This is our great opportunity. But how are we going to respond? This morning's reading 
the story of Zacchaeus wants to help us to find the right way to react to Jesus' visit. From this story, we see what we should do. Grab the opportunity with both hands. Make sure you get to see him as he passes by. And don't rest until you've taken him home for a meal. Jesus is passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. He's just passing through. But he ends up staying over and enjoying a meal. But with the last person we would have expected. With Zacchaeus, the tax collector. The host in the story is defined in three ways. He is called a man named Zacchaeus. A man named Zacchaeus. He is a tax collector, which means not just, I mean, even in Taiwan, tax collectors are not actually our favorite people, are they? Uh, we None of us like to pay taxes. But in, uh, in those times, a tax collector uh, collected money actually for the Roman conquerors, for the occupiers of his country. So he's a person who collaborates with the enemies of his people who have come to occupy their country. And he works with the Romans and he even makes a lot of money out of that. He's not just a tax collector. We read here that he is the chief tax collector. So this man has made it to the top. He is having a very successful career. He has power and authority where it counts, with the Romans, the ones who are the government. And we read that he is a very rich man. He has money, he has possessions, everything is hard desires, and that in a country where the vast majority of the people are desperately poor. So, a man of status, a man with financial security, a man in with those in power, well-connected, we would say a successful man. That is the one way he is described. But he's also described as a sinful man. That is how the people see him. The people of Jericho, they know this guy. They know who he is. And when they see Jesus going into his house, they are not happy. This man may be successful, but he's very unpopular. We already see something written in verse 3, where Jesus comes through. He wants to see Jesus, but because he's small, he cannot. Well, if he's small, he just can, can get to the front. But the people won't make, ma make way for this guy. That's the, the least they can do to this guy they don't like is to block him from seeing Jesus. Uh, and later, when Jesus goes to his house, there's a lot of grumbling and complaining about Jesus visiting this man. Well, from Zacchaeus' point of view, he probably wasn't bothered that much. If you are a rich man, why do you care what the poor people think about you? He uh, had his rich uh, other tax collecting friends. He's a rich person. He's influential. He has his own circle of friends, other people like himself. So I don't think he, he probably didn't care that much about what the local people thought about him. The third way that he is described is how Jesus sees him. And Jesus calls him in verse 9, a son of Abraham. A son of Abraham. That is his real identity. He is a son of Abraham, which means, as a Jew, he belongs to God's people. He has a share in all God's promises to Abraham. As a son of Abraham, he is a very privileged man because he belongs to the people among all the nations of the world, the only people who truly, truly know God. He, knows he belongs to God's people. He has identity. He is a member of a community, the community of God, the people of God. But this is what Zacchaeus has left behind, what he has lost. He has lost this identity. He has lost the sense of belonging to the posterity of Abraham. Zacchaeus chose his own lifestyle. And because of his choice, he became very successful. But in the process, his own people became his enemies. 
He has status, he has financial security, but he has lost his identity, his relationship with God. Zacchaeus is a successful businessman, but he is lost. Now let's stand back for a moment and ask ourselves, where do I stand today? How do I see myself? Zacchaeus saw himself as a successful man. How do I see myself? How do others see me? Others saw him as a sinner. How do other people see me? But most important, how does God see me? How does God see me today? As members of the church, we too are children of Abraham. We too are children of God. We too have this privilege of knowing God, of belonging to God's people. We too grow up and live as members of God's people. We belong to a community. We have an identity. But what do we do with this opportunity? How important do we consider this identity to be? Is it really important to us that we are sons of Abraham, daughters of God? Is it really that important to us that we belong to God's people? The passage of today is a warning to us because here is Zacchaeus, a son of Abram, with all these uh, privileges, but he is lost. Because in his successful pursuit of worldly benefits, he has neglected and forgotten his true identity. He is rich, he is powerful, he is successful, but he is hopelessly lost. And now Jesus appears on the scene. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus passes through Jericho. This is actually the last stop on his journey to Jerusalem. He passes through Jericho, the city where Zacchaeus lives. And Jesus is rumored to be a friend of tax collectors and sinners. There's this rumor going around. So perhaps Zacchaeus has heard this rumor and he wonders, who, who can this person be? This person wandering around with his ragtag group of followers, uh, wandering around all through Palestine, uh, all through the countryside, preaching and healing people. And he's called a friend of tax collectors. Why would this guy be a friend of tax collectors? He might have heard this rumor and become curious about Jesus. So... He seeks to see Jesus. He would like to see Jesus. Uh, we could even say Zacchaeus is becoming a seeker. What we call in Taiwan a mutaoyo. Huh? He's becoming a seeker. But how? What type of a seeker? We should look carefully at this guy. He wants to see Jesus. He doesn't want to meet Jesus. He just wants to see him. And he wants to form his own objective opinion of this person. So he wants to see Jesus who he was. That's how it's put in the original. And in this process, he keeps a safe distance. So he's a short man. He cannot see Jesus except if he really stands right in front where he's too visible. So he doesn't go up to the front. He runs ahead and he climbs up a big tree, a sycamore fig tree. More important uh, 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 about this tree is that it's a tree with very big leaves. So he can sit in this tree, hide there among the leaves. He can see Jesus without being seen himself. So Zacchaeus is a seeker, but he seeks Jesus on his own terms. From a safe distance, without having to commit himself, he actually seeks Jesus and hides from Jesus simultaneously. Uh, and actually sitting there among the fig leaves, we can just imagine, think back of Adam and Eve hiding behind their fig leaves. He finds actually more than he bargained for. He climbs up the tree, he sits there between the leaves so he can see Jesus, he's seeking to see Jesus, but what he finds is more than he bargained for. Because his plan fails. Jesus does not walk by. 
Jesus comes with all these crowds of people following him and he stops under the tree and he looks up and we can imagine as Jesus looks up, everybody looks up. And there sits Zacchaeus in the tree with his businessman suit and his little briefcase, <laughs> we can imagine, like a real businessman dressed up all ready for the job, sits up there in the tree. Very embarrassing. Everybody looks up at him. Zacchaeus finds that he is not the one seeking. He's not the only one seeking. Jesus is seeking too. And Jesus is seeking him. And Jesus is finding him. So what happens here is that Jesus breaks through this safe distance and establishes direct contact with Zacchaeus. And now comes the surprising thing. What does Jesus say? Zacchaeus, hurry down. I must stay in your house today. Now, this whole sentence is full of surprises. The first surprising thing is that Jesus knows his name. Zacchaeus. And Jesus calls him by his name. So he cannot look around. Perhaps Jesus is talking to somebody else. Jesus is definitely talking to me. Because <laughs> that's my name. <laughs> Jesus means him and nobody else. And he says, I must stay in your house. Now this word must is very important. Because in the Gospels, this word is used of the divine compulsion that Jesus has. The compulsion to do what God sent him to do. He must go to Jerusalem. He must die. He must be resurrected on the third day. And now, in addition to all these great musts, Jesus adds this must. I must go to your house today. And then the third thing is today. I must go to your house today. This is the moment of decision. Jesus doesn't say to him, uh, look at your agenda and see where, where you can fit me into your schedule. Huh? Uh, perhaps sometime this week would be okay. Jesus says, today. Today I must go to your house. Zacchaeus has to decide. How is he going to see this? Is he going to say, what a cheek. I am the most important man in Jericho. Who is this guy to invite himself to my house? Or... He can say, what a privilege. He wants to come to my house? So, let's stand back again a little and look at ourselves. Are we seeking Jesus like Zacchaeus? Would, would we like to catch sight of him as he passes through? Would we like to see him? If we are seeking Jesus, we may know we are already being sought. He's already looking for us. He knows us. And he calls us by name as he calls Zacchaeus by name. God takes the initiative. In Jeremiah 29 we read, God says, I know the plans I have for you. I know the plans I have for you. When you search for me, you will find me. Because I will let you find me. I will let you find me. God puts a hunger and thirst for him in our hearts. It's God who puts that hunger and thirst in our hearts. And God is seeking us through Jesus. Uh, the most famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3 verse 16, says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, so that we who believe in him may not be lost, but have, may not perish, but have eternal life. God is seeking us in Jesus. And this is the true meaning of Advent, is that Jesus came, and he came to look for us, to seek us. Jesus says so himself in the last verse of this passage we've read. He says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So, we've seen Zacchaeus sitting in the tree, listening to Jesus, having this choice. How is he going to see, to respond to the words of Jesus? What is he going to do? And what we see is that Jesus' unconditional self-invitation leads to a positive, even an enthusiastic response from Zacchaeus. We read that he hurried down from the tree, very happy, very excited, and he welcomed Jesus into his house. So different 
from this pious rich man we read about just a few verses earlier in the gospel. The rich man who kept the law of God all his life. Very good man, very pious man who came to Jesus. And when Jesus told him, get rid of all your stuff and follow me, he turned away. Sadly, he didn't follow Jesus. Zacchaeus, this unrighteous man, this man with a very bad living situation, he responds wholeheartedly. How do the bystanders react? Well, as we would expect, they get very upset. Jesus is coming to our town. He's passing through. Why on earth would he go exactly to this guy's house? The worst choice he could make. How can he go to Zacchaeus' house? They expect Jesus to lay down conditions before going to this house. This man is a sinner. Jesus should first give him some conditions. If you do this, if you do that, then I will go to your house. But Jesus doesn't do that. He uh, unconditionally, unconditionally, he invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. The transformation happens exactly because of this. Zacchaeus can change, not because Jesus demands of him that he should first change before Jesus would go to his house, but because Jesus so unconditionally goes to him, shows him his concern, becomes his guest, enjoys his hospitality, goes to his house as if he is just another person in Israel. Without any judgment, without any criticism, Jesus just goes to his house. Because of that, because he feels so accepted, he can change. Jesus' acceptance gives Zacchaeus the courage and the strength to change. And what a change. His life is turned upside down. The first thing he says is the poor. The people he never noticed, the people he never cared about, the poor. Suddenly he notices them. I want to give half my possessions to the poor. Or you could say, why only half? Because Zacchaeus is not just uttering empty words. He's done some calculations in his head. He cannot give everything to the poor because he also has some other responsibilities. He still has to do some restitution. All this uh, uh, tax cheating he's done to get some money out of the people paying the taxes, he has to pay back. And he says, just to give the money back is not good enough. I give back fourfold. Four times as much as what I uh, pressed out of people. Now, I don't know my mathematics how that is, but according to my calculations, he's going to go out quite empty. If he gives away half of what he has and he gives back four times what he stole, I don't know how much of what he had is actually what he stole, so <laughs> he's not going to have a lot left. And he does this not because he's reacting to the bystanders, to make the people happy who are complaining, no. He does this out of gratitude. He's grateful to Jesus for coming to his house. He's grateful to Jesus for accepting him as he is. And because Jesus has, become, has been so generous to him, he can afford to be generous in turn. In this story, Jesus has the last word. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. This is the second today in this story. Today I must go to your house. And now Jesus says, today. What Jesus gives, he gives now. Jesus wants us to make a decision now. Today I must come to your house. But Jesus also gives us now. Today salvation has come to this house. And what Jesus gives is salvation, is life. Life in all its fullness. The life that God alone can give. And this salvation is not just for Zacchaeus, it's for this house. Because God cares not only for individuals, he cares and he deals with families. When he enters my life, when he enters my heart, he also enters my house, my family, my whole family benefits. So important this message for Taiwan, where so many Christians belong to families where many other members are not Christian. If I surrender myself to God, if I dedicate myself to God, I can trust God to work through me to bless my house, my family. 
And then Jesus says, this man is a son of Abraham. A son of Abraham. Jesus restores his identity. The identity which he lost because of his wrong choices in life. Jesus restores it to him. Jesus reaffirms that this man belongs to the people of God. And now he's really a son of Abraham. Because he's learned to trust God like Abraham did. This is what Jesus came for. And this is what Advent is about. Jesus didn't come to be seen, to be admired, to be marveled at, to be worshipped. He came to save us. So, in conclusion. In one day, Zacchaeus, the rich chief tax collector of Jericho, loses all his possessions and becomes poor. Not because of a collapse of the stock market, but because Jesus ate with him. That's something to consider. It's dangerous to eat with Jesus. We're going to eat with Jesus soon. Remember, it's dangerous. Because he ate with Jesus, he lost all his possessions. Different from the rich young man, he did not turn away from Jesus. He allowed Jesus to enter his house, to enter his heart, and to enter his family. Because he extended hospitality to Jesus, he in turn experienced the hospitality of God, God's open arms. Because he welcomed Jesus into his house, he experienced God's welcome back into his presence, back into his embrace. But for Zacchaeus, this was not a disastrous day. This was the day he received new life, he and his house. Advent means that Jesus is coming to town. When Jesus comes to visit, everything becomes new. Jesus is a guest who not only eats with us, but who turns our lives upside down. Or rather, we should say, who puts our upside down lives in order again. That is why he came. He didn't come to be admired, to be praised, to be adored. He came to seek us and to give us what we really need. Salvation, a life, a life with God. He wants to be my guest. He invites himself to my house. What he says to Zacchaeus, he says to each of us, today I must stay in your house. Let us welcome Jesus with joy. We pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son, for sending Jesus to live among us, even to enter our houses, to sit down at table with us, to eat with us, to bring order in our disordered lives, to give us new direction, to give us new hope, to give us joy. We thank you, Lord, that through this story of Zacchaeus, you remind us again that the most important thing in our lives, the most important thing for us is not to be successful. It is to realize that you love us, that we have an identity which is far above any identity the world can offer, that we are the children of God. We thank you that through Jesus you made it possible for us to become your children. And we pray that this Advent, this Christmas, you will remind us of this, the most precious gift of all, that you give us your son so that we too can become your children. In Jesus' name, amen.